It may not look like it today, but nearly 250 years ago, this was a bustling center of shipping and maritime commerce, known as Griffin's Wharf. It was here on December 16, 1773, that 130 angry British subjects stormed some ships, dumped out some tea, and made coffee the number one drink in what was to become America. So what prompted coffee to become America's drink? For that, we have to go all the way back to the 1760s when Britain found itself under incredible national debt and its largest imperial monopoly on the verge of bankruptcy. In 1756, Britain found itself at war with France for world dominance. While Britain was eventually victorious in 1763, it had doubled its national debt. Between 1756 and 1763, the British defeated the French in the Seven Years' War a war that plunged Britain into incredible debt and resulted in the Royal Proclamation of 1763. A major component of this expansion was the prohibition of colonial expansion beyond the Appalachian Mountains into Indian territories, a clause that angered expansionist hungry colonials. The tea trade was highly regulated and taxed in Britain. Only the East India Tea Company could import teas from China, which they would sell to local companies for distribution within the country and then onward to the colonies. East India paid a 25% duty on importation and then additional taxes were levied in country. The Townsend Revenue Act of 1767 imposed additional tax on tea exported to the colonies, angering the colonists even more. With thousands of pounds of tea rotting in British warehouses, they were desperate and cut a deal with the Crown to export the tea directly to the colonies that resulted in the Tea Act of 1773. That fall, 600,000 pounds of tea were shipped to the colonies. Much of that tea had already degraded sitting in London warehouses for two years. When the ships arrived, the colonists refused the shipments, preferring to leave them rotting. And on December 16, 1773, 130 men stormed the vessels Beaver, Dartmouth and Eleanor, dumping 342 chests of tea, about 92,000 pounds, right here into Boston Harbor. A number of the attackers dressed as Mohawk Indians in an attempt to push the Crown to drop the proclamation of 1763 and allow the colonists to invade and attack Indian lands. While that never happened, once the American Revolution resulted in the United States, the former colonists were freed from the Royal Proclamation of 1763, paving the way for the Indian Removal Act of 1830 and the genocide of over 8,000 Native Americans. There's a historical marker at the Evelyn Moakley Bridge at the corner of Atlantic and Seaport Boulevards on the north side of the bridge that's attached to the building on the right side of the street. The Boston Tea Party Museum, a place where you can relive the dumping of the tea, lies a quarter mile that way about a thousand feet or three football fields away. The original Griffin's Wharf was located on the edge of what was then known as the Shawmut Peninsula. The water was here where I stand now. Land reclamation projects over the past 200 years doubled the land area of the peninsula and quadrupled all of Boston. So as right here where the Rose Kennedy Greenway stands today and Interstate 93 runs beneath my feet, that coffee became the drink of choice in the United States of America. Which kind of answers the question why Boston is called Beantown. This is rare coffee. The sons, the sons, the sons, the sons of free America.